Thank you, Joe. <laughs> so I'd, I would like to apologize for not having any abstract, but I was uh, asked to do this rather late, so that's my excuse. The, uh, so the <coughs> finite group scheme is a very special example of the notion of a group in a category. If you have a category C, I won't do this very long. C with uh, finite products, you can, you have the notion of a group in the category or a C group. G, which is simply an object G in the category together with a map that looks like a law of composition. And the only axiom on that map is that for all objects T in C, the set home CTG should be a group under the law of composition which this map induces on this set. Now, that <clears throat> has some consequences. If you take T to be uh, the final object, that is the empty product, then you have the unit element in G of that final object, call the finite, finite object this, and the unit element is a map from that to G. So you have such, such a map, E, let's call this C for a composition. And also the inverse of the identity map in G of G gives you a map from G to G, which is like taking an element to its inverse. So if you have a group in a category, you have these three maps. And on the other hand, if you have an object with such maps, then satisfying suitable axioms, this should be associative in an obvious sense, and this should be an identity or a neutral element in an obvious sense, and so on. Then you have a group in a category, in the category C. Now, the of course, the category we're interested in is the category of schemes over some base scheme, usually a, a, some kind of Dedekind ring or local ring or something of that sort, or a field for that matter. <laughs> and the uh, interplay of the scheme theory and the group theory leads to very a lot of interesting things. For example, if so if our base scheme is spec of a field and we take G to be a projective, uh, projective variety over that field, irreducible, then if we have a law of composition which makes it a group, you have what's called an abelian variety. It's, the rigidity uh, forces the thing to be commutative in particular. So, and if the variety is of dimension one, it's an elliptic curve, something we are hearing about here. But in this talk, I'm not talking, uh, I'm talking about finite group schemes which are essentially affine. At least if the base is affine, then they're affine. So let's, let's stick to affine schemes. Uh, well, and what would that, how would you have such a thing? Let's say we have a ground ring R. An affine scheme is given by an R algebra A. And if it's a group scheme, it'll be furnished with a homomorphism, of course, unless I say otherwise, when I say algebra or ring, I mean commutative with identity, uh, with a homomorphism of A into A tensor R A, uh, reflecting this. I mean, G, the point is G will be the spec A, and spec reverses arrows, and tensor product corresponds to product. So we would have thing here, and I'll call this C also. 
And the, the, uh, of course, the final object is spec R, and this E is simply then a map from A to R, a homomorphism of rings. And the, well, the I is something from A to A. But now A is an R algebra, and the multiplication gives you a map the other way, which I'll call D. And the unit element gives you a map the other w here the other way, which let's say I call this E, I could call that one or something. I mean, it's the thing that maps one to one. <laughs> and so, uh, so a, a, an affine R group or amounts to what's called a, well, it's an algebra, but it's also a co-algebra. In other words, it's a bi-algebra. This, uh, the multiplication is, uh, is understood to be commutative. We're, we're talking about spectrum of commutative things, but the C is just, well, it's of course commutative and associative, but the C, the C is only associative in a rather obvious sense, which I won't write down, not necessarily commutative. The commutativity of C would mean the commutativity of the group. Uh, so this is a bi-algebra which is commutative but associative but commutative but not co-commutative necessarily. In recent years, the subject of bi-algebras which are neither commutative nor co-commutative has uh, become of considerable interest. That's called quantum groups, but that so far has nothing to do with arithmetic. So. We won't worry about that here. On the contrary, most of what I say will have to do with commutative group schemes. Well, let's have an example. Uh, the, the multiplicative group GM is spec A, where A is, if it's over R, is the polynomial ring in which you invert the variable T, polynomial in one variable then uh, the points of GM with values in some, with coordinates, whatever you want to call it, in some R algebra B, what is that? That's just the, by definition, it's, it's the homomorphisms in the category of R algebras of A into B. But to give a homomorphism of this ring, as an R algebra into B is just to give an image of T, but that image must be invertible. So this is just B star by taking the, the image of T, the multiplicative group of B. So it's commutative. Well, uh, uh, that's what this is. I forgot, I neglected to give the law of composition here, but it's defined by C of T equals T tensor T, that corresponding to the fact that in this group of points, the, the law of composition is simply multiplication in, in B. So this is for all B, for all R algebras B. Uh, being commutative, that uh, multiplication or raising <laughs> raising to an integer power gives you a homomorphism of that group into itself. Say x goes to x to the n. That in any commutative group, you, you have such a homomorphism. And what is its kernel? Well, I haven't said anything about kernel. I can talk about kernels in this general context, at least if I have fibered products, because if I have a homomorphism of a group uh, of group schemes in, in a category, then using the, what is the kernel of that homomorphism? It's the stuff that goes to the identity. And the identity is an arrow like that. And I can just form the fibered product G cross uh, dot over G prime and 
if you think about it a minute, you see that the points of this with values in any t is the kernel of the map from the points of this with values in t to that with values in t. So this is the kernel of f. Uh, the kernels are trivial in, in the theory of group schemes. The co-kernels are, are, is a totally different matter. It's much more subtle, a business of dividing by the action of a group. Anyway, you have the notion of kernel. Now, what is the kernel of this map in GM? Well, it's clear what it, the functor it represents is. That is, the, the, kernel, the kernel of that is called mu m. And all of these schemes, the GM and mu m, are defined over z, but if I'm looking at them over an arbitrary ring r, uh, and, of course, mu m, then, of an algebra b is simply the set of b and b, such that b to the n is 1. And, of course, it is the spec mu n is, or over, b, over r, so is spec of the ring r, T, the polynomial ring, divided by the ideal generated by <coughs> T to the n minus 1, which is spec, if you want, of R plus RT plus RT to the n minus 1, with the un where this is a free module of rank n over R, with the uh, with the multiplication being given by t to the n equal 1. So th now, this is an example of the subject of this talk. It is a finite flat group scheme over R of rank n. So maybe it's time for a new board. Uh. So, <clears throat> the definition is very simple. Uh, definition, a finite flat, I'll call it FF, uh, group scheme over a base ring R. I'll just do it over a base ring. I mean, you can easily sheafify it. Is a group over R G equals spec A, where the A, where A is free, oops, is locally free <laughs> of finite rank, uh, say N, well, finite rank over R, as an R module, as R module. Put it that way, yeah. And the rank of A as R module is, might be called the order of G, because that's, that's what it's analogous to. Of the, yeah. So there's one example. Mm. What we should think, when you have that situation, and, and for heaven's sake, let's think of R. If R, for example, is a local ring, or is a PID, then locally free is free, and then A is free. So you might as well think of that case. You get, you get the total picture that way, I mean, modulo trivialities. Uh, free as R module. Now, and you should think of A as the ring of functions on the group R, somehow. Now, 
with uh, when when you have things which are free of finite rank, you have a good duality if you look at module homomorphisms into R. So let A prime be the home. So R linear maps, not not algebra homomorphisms, are modules of A into R. It's like the dual of a vector space. If R were a field, it would be the dual space. Then there's a perfect duality, A to A prime. A prime prime is A and so on. And if you look at the axioms there, this, uh, the duality, of course, reverses arrows. So the C prime gives you a multiplication in A prime. A prime tensor A prime into A prime. And the D prime gives you a uh, C prime, well, I just, uh, D prime gives you that. And the, similarly, the E, the dual of the E arrow makes uh, this algebra A prime have an identity element, it have, have a one. Now, in general, if, if the group is not commutative, A prime is simply an associative algebra, and it's the analog of the group ring. Analog, well, A, so A is like functions, the ring of functions on R, and A prime is uh, on G, what am I saying? And on this uh, hypothetical finite group scheme, finite flat group scheme G, and A prime is, well, I shouldn't say equal, but it's, that's how you should think of it, is like the group ring of G. In fact, if you, I guess I should give the, the example of the constant group scheme, example, uh, suppose I have an honest finite group, uh, well, I'll call it G, <laughs> G of, a group in the category of sets, a finite group. Um, then I can, the constant group scheme has, I make A, I take A to be the, well, the R-valued functions on G, maps, just random maps from G to R. Of course, it's isomorphic to the product of as many copies as a module, the product of as many copies of, even as a ring, as, a, uh, as many copies of R as the, there are elements of G. And then spec A, you make into a group scheme in the obvious way, is called, call it G underlined or something, is the constant group scheme. And, uh, yeah. So, now if, if, uh, if you have a finite flat commutative group G, then the axioms are completely self-dual. The bi-algebra is, is commutative and co-commutative, and this A prime thing, the spectrum of A prime, with D prime as the law of composition, it gives you a group called the Cartier dual. G prime equals spec. So G commutative now. From now on, I'll only speak of commutative group schemes. Uh, spec A prime with uh, law D prime is the Cartier dual of A and of G, rather, and uh, it's that, with that you really understand the duality of finite abelian groups in full generality. I mean, it's, it's absolutely marvelous. What could be uh, simpler than that? For, <coughs> for example, uh, 
if, if G is, is the, the constant scheme Z mod NZ, I've described there, then the G prime is mu N. I let you figure that out, is the, is the group, the nth roots of unity scheme. They are dual. Um, what did I want to say? It's gone, oh well. Of course, the G prime prime is G. Oh, I know what I wanted to say, of course. G prime prime is G, it's perfect duality. And G prime represents the functor you would think it does. That is, if you take points of G prime with coordinates in some ring, uh, some R algebra, I do it always over R, uh, some R algebra B, what is that? Well, that's the home. Well, let me just do it for R because by, <laughs> by base extension, it, it's the same. Of course, I, I, I can't say everything. If you have, a, if you have a, a G over R, which is say spec A, then, and you have a, an extension ring or an R algebra, R prime, then you can take G cross R, R prime, which is spec of A tensor R, R prime. Well, this prime has nothing to do with that prime. And that will be a group scheme over R prime in a natural way. And the points of that with coordinates in R prime are the same as the points of G with coordinates in R prime. So, I don't lose generality by just taking points in R. And that is the, what is that? That's the homomorphism group of homomorphisms as R group schemes of G into GM. That's uh, just what you'd think. That is, it's the dual, it's the hom into, into the multiplicative group. And, well, I could exp make that explicit. A homomor homomorphism into GM, if it were not a group scheme homomorphism, would just be a, an F in, in A, set of F in A, such that, such that what? I guess it should be invertible. But to have it, uh, that's what be, that would be the homomorphisms of R schemes. But if you wanted group schemes, then you have to have C of F be F tensor F. And this is just the, and now such an F, okay, well. <laughs> And those are, those are just the ones such that in the pairing of A and A prime into R that is the bilinear, the, the linear duality, if you pair an F prime with F, it gives a homomor a, a, an algebra homomorphism, not just a linear homomorphism. So that's the story behind that. Now, uh, I should give some well, Hilbert, Hilbert uh, once said, should always begin with the simplest example. Uh, Siegel, at the end of a paper, I noticed once, where a paper where he gave some beautiful examples, rather, rather intricate of calculations, deplored the modern style of writing without, uh, without giving any examples, or if you did give an example, he said nowadays, it was of the set, the example was of the example of the set with no elements, or the group with one element, or the field with two elements. <laughs> well, I'm not going to do much better than that, but I want to give an example 
of a group scheme of order, finite flat group scheme of order two. It has to do with a field with two elements, but it's a group, so. Uh, <laughs> oh, I didn't. Uh oh. Ah. Pretty good. So uh, this actually works over any ring because <clears throat> 2 minus 1 is 1 and so on. But uh, so let R be arbitrary. And suppose you have elements gamma and delta in R such that gamma delta is 2. In other words, you have a factorization of 2. OK. Well, let me just to give you the, ex for example, R might be the two attic integers with pi adjoined, where pi is a 17th root of 2. And then you could have gamma equal pi to the i, and delta equal pi to the 17 minus i was <coughs> i being an integer between 0 and 17. So you'd have 18 possibilities there, up to units, which is all that will matter. Well, then, <coughs> with, with such a factorization, you can define g gamma delta, of an FF <laughs> group scheme over r of order 2. Uh, it's going to be this spec A. The delta is giving you the structure of A. A is R plus R T, say, where T squared is delta T. And the law of composition is C of T. I just have to give C of T. I mean, this is R times 1. C of 1 is 1. C of T is <coughs> t tensor 1 plus 1 tensor t plus you know, minus gamma. I hope I've got the sign right. You can check me. A gamma t tensor t. So that's in a tensor a. That's the law of compositions. In other words, what is the functor? <coughs> G gamma delta of an R algebra B, the points with coordinates are in B, is just a homomorphism of this R algebra into B. That's an element of B whose square is delta times it. So that's a set of x in B such that x squared is delta x. <clears throat> and if you have an, two points like that, say x and y, what is the, what is it? What, what is x times y in this group, in this set theoretic group? Well, this is, it's given by this. It's x plus y minus gamma xy. OK, now I leave it to you to check that this is, again, the coordinate of a point so that that's well defined. In other words, that the square of this thing is equal to delta times this thing, that that follows from using this relation. <clears throat> and uh, also that this law of composition is associative and commutative. And the unit element is 0. x equals 0 is obviously a unit element. Uh, 0 dot y is y. Well, and so on. So you can also, the G gamma delta is, is isomorphic to G gamma prime delta prime if and only if gamma prime is U gamma and delta prime is U inverse delta for some unit, for some unit. U in R. 
invertible element. Uh, uh, so, in, for example, in this case, these are up to isomorphism. There are over this ring, and it, it, over a local ring, or more generally, if over a local ring are these are the only group schemes of order two. So, over this local ring, up to isomorphism, there are exactly 18 finite flat group schemes of order two. Uh, you can check that if you take uh, if you take well you can certainly check that the Cartier duality just interchanges gamma and delta and what are the we know we know uh, two group schemes of order two over R what is this this is <clears throat> what must that be? Well, we want a yeah, we want delta equal one. So that's G two one, and mu two. Yeah, I let you check is G one two. Uh, I think uh, Larry Washington said sometimes mu two is the same as U two and uh, Z mod two Z, and sometimes it isn't. Well, you can see the, exactly when it is. If two is invertible, they're the same. They're isomorphic. If two is not invertible, they're not. Uh, in a field of, <clears throat> well, I've got to get going now. Uh, what about Instead of two, what if I take a prime number p? So p a prime. And I want to look at group schemes of order p. Well, Ort and I did that, and you need a, you don't, it doesn't work over a general R. Morally speaking, it works over R if R is a ZP algebra. So let me assume that from now on. R is an algebra over ZP, periodic integers. Then we, <clears throat> we proved that a, a finite flat thing of order P is killed by, <clears throat> is commutative and killed by P. So in other words, it's <clears throat> if G is of order P, just like this is commutative and killed by two, you see, what is x dot x? Where is x? Here. x dot x is x plus x. That's 2x minus gamma x squared. But x squared is delta. Yeah, that's right. Gamma. That's gamma delta. That's 2x minus 2x. That's 0. So x dot x is 0, which is which is right. OK, well, that's in general true for a G of order P. It's commutative and killed by P. And therefore, it, it, it's, an, it's an FP vector space, or uh, uh, vector space scheme, or whatever you want to say. But the point is that you have the multiplication of FP star Fp star, the uh, <coughs> cyclic of order p minus 1 prime, prime to p acts, acts as automorphisms on G. And that's what enabled us to classify these things. Uh, the more so, we had to assume 1 over p minus 1 is exists. P minus 1 is invertible. You see, that was no condition for 2. But in, in ZP, it is. P minus 1 is invertible there, so it is invertible. And that means that you can break up the A, I, I, something I neglected to say, for any, fi any group scheme, A is R plus I. 
where I is the augmentation ideal, it's the functions on the group which vanish at the identity, or it's the kernel of the thing I called E up there. It's a direct sum of R and an ideal. In other words, R is a quotient as well as a subthing of it. <clears throat> and now, if A is of rank P, R is of rank 1 as an R module, so I must be of rank P minus 1. And uh, <coughs> I, <coughs> you have a group of order P minus 1 acting on I, and you have the P minus first roots of unity in ZP, so you can write I as a direct sum of I chi, summing over characters chi of the multiplicative group of F. Now there is FP of FP. There is one fundamental character, call it chi 1, which is such that if you follow this by going to the residue field, you get identity. Well, I should, <coughs> on FP star. And it's just looking at the axioms, you find well, let's, let's assume R is local, so it's, this is not only a projective rank 1, but free rank 1, just to simplify notation. So if, <coughs> if you call I chi equal R T chi, let T chi be a basis for that free thing of rank 1, well, first of all, we could prove that, just as you would suspect, that each of the i chi, yeah, I should have said that, each of the i chi is of rank 1. Every chi appears. This is the chi eigenspace, and each, one occur, each of the p minus 1 chi's occurs, and then you find t chi prime, t chi second is <clears throat> is something I'll call maybe delta chi prime chi second, t chi prime chi second. I mean, it's just, and then the, you get a formula for C of t chi and so on, which involves some other constants. C <clears throat> I don't want to run, write it all out. Let me just say, <clears throat> you, you've got some other constant, c chi prime chi second, and then the axiom that the, if you have two elements in fp star, that their sum, if say their sum is, if it is not zero, acts on the group according to the sum of the actions, of, in the group of the actions of each of them, Using that, you find that <coughs> the, the C, C, <coughs> C times the delta, C chi prime chi second times delta chi prime chi second is equal to a certain number, W chi prime chi second in ZP, which is absolutely universal. I could give you, it's just expressed in terms of additive and multiplicative characters of the finite uh, group. In fact, it's more morally, it's a Jacobi sum. And, or it's inexpressible in terms of Gauss sums. And there's a whole classical uh, literature about that and uh, using that or using this system to reprove the well-known things. You find that a lot of these are units so that these things are units. And you find that the T, for the basic character chi 1 generates the A. You get that A is R T chi 1, and T chi 1 to the P is something, it's, it's something like a delta T chi 1. Just like this with 2, but and then you can, you find that if you factor P into gamma delta, 
uh, corresponding to those factorizations, you get groups. Now, and that was just a playing, it was just playing with, with, uh, with Gauss sums and <clears throat> Jacobi sums and so on to prove that. And it was obvious to me that if you replaced FP by any finite field, that you could play the same game. But I thought that's really very artificial. Why bother? I couldn't have been more wrong. Serre and Renault knew better, <laughs> as I hope I have time to explain. From the rest of, for the rest of the time, I'll be talking about results of Reynaud's paper in the Bulletin de la Société Mathématique de France of 1974, <coughs> entitled uh, Schema en groupe du type uh, P, 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 P. In, in, <coughs> so killed by P is what he means. <laughs> uh, 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 Abelian, so FP vector spaces. Now, uh, he, so the first thing he did was do exactly what Ort and I did, only assuming that you have a, it's an FQ vector space, space scheme over uh, such an R, a R, and let, <coughs> he, we may have to adjoin here the Q minus first roots of unity. I'll just symbolically denote it by that. So it make a little unramified extension of ZP over, over th then such an R. An R which is a... And then you have the same decomposition I is the direct sum of I chi's, where now it's the sum of Q minus one chi's. But now you have, instead of one fundamental character, it is more complicated. You have R of them if, if Q is P to the R. <clears throat> because this is just an abstract field with Q elements. And into the residue field of, the, of, uh, <clears throat> of this, there are R different field homomorphisms, and each of those R different ones gives you a character. And those are the fundamental characters emphasized by Serre, and you can order them in such a way, uh, maybe I should go back up here. You can order them in such a way that each one to the <clears throat> to the pth power is the next one, given the theory of finite fields. That's obvious. So you you have these fundamental characters, chi one, chi r and chi i to the p is chi i plus one mod i, with i going mod r. The numbering is arbitrary, you can start anywhere. <clears throat> and, uh, and then in the same way, Raynaud proved that r, that a is generated over r, by T1, TR, or TI, where the I chi I is our TI. TI is a generator. Let's take R local. The generator for the chi I eigenspace of the action of the multiplicative group of the, of the scalar field. And that the, the structure of A as an algebra was given by Ti to the P equal delta I Ti, where for each I you have a factorization of P. P equals delta I gamma I. 
for each i. It can, you, the third factor, factorization can vary with i. And then, as is pretty obvious, the well, you can say when two things are isomorphic, but I'm going to come back to that anyway. Uh, well, in the C of Ti, the law of composition in the group is again given by explicit things involving uh, Gauss and Jacobi sums. You can just write it down in, in terms of this factorization of P. Uh, th this involves the gamma i's and, uh, and some other numbers, units, which you make up out of some w's, which are universal. <clears throat> so, Raynaud did that, but now the, to see the point of doing that, let's take a, <clears throat> a different, different point of view. Now we come to the really good stuff. The, the let, well then now, let's, we're working over z, p, q, p. Let's take, let's take a finite, or maybe it might be the, let's take a finite extension of, what am I doing, q, p, and the ring of, let r be the ring of integers in there. And then, of course, I have the, unramified, maximal unramified extension, and then the maximal tamely ramified extension, and then the algebraic closure. And I have various Galois groups, which we'll talk about when we need to. And let's take the point of view now that <clears throat> we have a, groups, a finite flat group scheme over K, and we want to see, can we get it from R? I mean, if we were doing, instead of finite flat things, if we had a, an elliptic curve over k, then, well, the nice thing would be if it has good reduction at the, this place, and then we'd, the, that would mean there's an elliptic curve over r whose general fiber over k is the one we started with. In general, you have to take the narrow model, which is not <clears throat> complete, but if it has good reduction, you can take a complete thing over R. Well, anyway, for the finite flat group schemes, as we saw, have I lost it already? No, up there. <clears throat> if the K is gotten by the 17th root of 2 over Q2, we, it amount, that amounts to saying there are 18 groups over R, which give the group of order 2 constant, or, see, k is of characteristic 0. Mu 2 is the same as, the con as z mod 2z over k. And there are 18 different things over r which give it. OK. <clears throat> so let's call a g the group here, following Raynaud and script, g the group over r. Which, and we take the point of view, give a, given a g, what g's are there? Or this will be spec A over K, and this will be spec of script A. Well then, <clears throat> so, now I re I've neglected to say the basics. Over a f field of characteristic zero, which K is, <clears throat> uh, I think it's Cartier who proved that any group scheme, say affine for some, the, that the A for any affine group scheme has no nilpotent elements. So if it's finite flat, it's a tal. That is, the A is a product of separable, finite separable field extensions. So G is an atal, finite atal scheme over K. Well, <clears throat> which is a group scheme. Now, finite etal schemes over a field K, any field, are just the same as finite sets on which the Galois group of the field operates. And therefore, 
a finite commutative group scheme, which we're starting with, is the same as a finite abelian group on which the Galois group of k bar over k operates. So in other words, g is the same thing. Well, and what is the, that abelian group? It's just the same thing as a g. I'll call this group gal, gal sub k. <clears throat> this corresponds to g of k bar, the points in k bar, which is a gal module, finite Galois module. <clears throat> and conversely, if you give a Galois module, you easily make the A. It's the fun k bar valued functions on the module, which are invariant by the action of G, are equivariant of, of gal. OK, so <clears throat> just by, <clears throat> and we want it, it's only interesting over QP, over ZP, it's only interesting to look at things of, of P power order or even killed by P. So I could say an FP gal module. Why don't we look at that? And then I'm interested in, in can I extend it? Can I get a G over R of which this is the general fiber? Well, what does that amount to algebraically? It's the old business of finding an order in A. The, the classical term is order. <clears throat> the A will be a, a, sub, <clears throat> a ZP subalgebra of A. which is finite over ZP. And <clears throat> so we just need that. Together with the fact we have this, we, by giving this, we have a C of <clears throat> mapping A into A tensor A, the vector space over K, and we just need that C of A is in A tensor A. That's all we, that's, once we have that, we're done. I mean, the, so the, the finding these G's is finding orders in A, which by the law of composition are carried into their tensor product with themselves. That's all it is, amounts to. <clears throat> well, so, let's see, yeah, good. Um, so there's some general stuff to be said. Let's, <clears throat> we can, well, first of all, Raynaud observes that given two such G, script Gs for the same G, they have a, 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 a soup that is, I mean, that's a total triviality. I, <clears throat> if you have two A's, t I, so I fix, I fix the G, that is, I fix the Latin A. That's fixed. And I'm looking for A's. If I have two of them, A1 and A2, then I claim A equals A1, A2 is another one. And I let you check it, I mean, there's nothing to it. So any two are contained in a third. And on the other hand, since A is a tal, it's a, <clears throat> it's a product of separable, finite separable field extensions. The integral closure of ZP and A is, is a finite ZP module. And these things are all contained in it. So if there is any A at all, there's a biggest A. That's very important, the biggest A. And by Cartier duality, if the things are commutative, as I am assuming, there's the smallest one. But we, I don't think we need that. <clears throat> Raynaud calls them A plus and A minus. So they always exist. If there is any A, there's the biggest and the smallest. Okay. Now, this is the, <laughs> This is the real point. 
Let's suppose that let's go up to now K unramified, or as Raynaud would say, this R is strict Hensel and evaluation. K unramified, yeah. Then the Galois group is the inertia group, right? And it has a normal subgroup, which is a pro P, pro P group. And the quotient is the tame stuff, which is, <coughs> well, it's abelian. It's, it's an inverse limit of cyclic groups of, of orders prime to P. But that's the key, it's abelian, and this is pro P. Okay, let's assume that this general fiber is simple over K on Ramified. In other words, this Galois module, this is now an, an inertia, inertia module. The inertia group operates. Let's assume it's simple. Okay, it's simple and it's killed by P. It's a vector space over FP. PV is zero. Call it V. We'll call it V just to so it's simple over the inertia group. Well, so it's a module over a commutative ring, FP, uh, the group ring of the, ah, uh, sorry, oops, stop. The pro P group, the wild inertia, then acts trivially. Why? Because if a P group acts on a <clears throat> P power module, it leaves something non-trivial fixed. And since the, this uh, wild stuff is a normal subgroup of the whole inertia group, the stuff it leaves fixed is a submodule for the whole inertia group. But if the module is simple, the only non-trivial submodule is the whole thing. So the whole thing is left fixed by the pro P group. So the action is through the inertia group. Uh, so, through the tame inertia group, tame stuff, which is commutative. So it's an action by the inertia tame, the, <coughs> F, the group ring of that over FP, that's a commutative ring. Now a simple module over a commutative ring is just a one-dimensional vector space over the quotient of that ring by a maximal ideal over a field. So this V, <clears throat> which is a finite module, is a one-dimensional vector space over a field, which is obviously then a finite field. So we have the setup that Raynaud analyzed. That's why it's not artificial to consider <clears throat> vector one-dimensional vector space modules. It's because, as Sarah and Raynaud realized, over the maximum ramified extension, you get them. Okay, now, another point. If <clears throat> this simple thing can be extended, if there is a, a script G at all, then there is a script G, maybe not the one you started with, but another one, which also has the action of that finite field. Namely, just take, where did I put it? A, take the A plus. The maximal thing has to be invariant on, by automorphisms. And so the action <coughs> of the, the, the non-zero elements of the finite field extends to the A plus. So if it, okay. And so now, you, if, the thing can be, if there is any script G at all, it's one of the kind that Reno, there is one of the kind that Reno analyzed. And now I don't have much time, do I have any time left? No. Well, so, <laughs> let me just, uh, he, he has such a complete control 
Let me just sketch the idea. <clears throat> so suppose the theorem, the theorem that I want to end with is that if, yeah, if E <clears throat> is less than P minus one, what is E? E is the ramification of this K over QP, or this R. In other words, P is like pi to the E, where pi is a prime in R. It's the absolute ramification of the R I'm starting with. Then, <clears throat> starting with a G over K, a, uh, <clears throat> there is at most one G. There is at most one G. This G for a given G over K. This is over R. In other words, you can't have that such, but of course when P is two, P minus one is one, and E can't be less than one. So this theorem doesn't work with two. But of course, when if, if as in Weil's work, if you're working over ZP, the E is one. And this works for any odd prime. So you, if you look at, well, G of uh, order P to the R, P to the, P to the N. So So when there's not much ramification, now why is, I can only briefly indicate that <clears throat> you do it by, I haven't said anything about uh, de Visage, that is an exact sequence, G prime, G, G second for, for finite group schemes. But that makes sense and the order of this is the product of the orders of that, and so on. And if you have a, if you have a, an exact sequence, and you can over the field, and you can, and you have a G for this G, then you can copy that upstairs. And with that, by the notion of schematic ad adherence, there you really use that you're over a discrete valuation ring. And so by Davis Sage, you can reduce this theorem here to the case over a, of a simple module where the general fiber, well, no, first, first, to do this over K, it's enough to do it over K unramified because if there were two, then <coughs> You could have one contained, one A contained in the other, and then when you go to K unramified, there'd be two. The E doesn't change when you go to K unramified. So we can go to K unramified, and then it's in, by Davis Sage reduced to the simple case, and then we have a vector space scheme of one dim dimension one and Raynaud's theory, and with this, you just work out by the trivial computation that there's only one, there can't be two. There's not, there may not be one, but there cannot be two. If you had two, you'd have ramification of more than, well, maybe I'll leave it go at that. The, <clears throat> let me just say that then, in this situation, the map from G over R to G, well, to GK, which is, I've been calling G over K, is a fully faithful, that is, if you have a homomorphism over the field of group schemes, it extends over the ring. And this embeds the, this category as a full sub, it's in the <coughs> full subcategory of this abelian category of, of Galois modules of P power order. And in fact, this is an abelian category under this hypothesis. And one other thing that, Ray, that this theory of Raynaud's did was, was uh, to 
prove a conjecture of Serres about the character through which inertia acts on a finite group scheme. And of course, the relevance of this whole business to this, I think, to this uh, conference is something I should have mentioned. That is, if you have an elliptic curve and you look at the map, the P map, then the kernel of that is, it's of a, a rank P squared of, of type P, P. So it's a finite, and if E has good reduction at a place over R, say, then that's a finite flat group scheme over R. It's one of these G's of, t of order P squared killed by P. And this theory applies, and that Sayre used that very much in his study of the action of Galois on points of finite order. Thank you.